our thoughts actually create reality. Consciousness and energy create reality, not just some thoughts, but all of our thoughts create reality. And that the students acquire knowledge and information so that they could have a more expanded rea reality. That if we have a small knowledge base, then we have a small reality. And if we have a larger knowledge base, then we get a ch chance to experience a larger reality. So a student becomes a scientist in the reality by seeing what thoughts produce a certain result. And the third premise is that uh, is to make known the unknown. Now, what does that mean to the average person out there? Our thinking produces reality if we have a greater level of thinking and we could actually give ourselves permission to analyze and to scrutinize and examine the what-ifs and the possibilities inside our brain, then we would all of a sudden start having alterations in our reality. So, making known the unknown, the human brain is aware in that level of the brain of 400 billion bits of information but we're only conscious of 2,000 do you know what those 2,000 are? if your back hurts if your shoes are tied too tight if you're wearing a hat if you're hungry if you're bored <laughs> if you're tired it's only, con it's only aware of information that has to do with the physical body so the this is where we're living. Our mind is living in the sea of the 400 billion bits of information that's constantly bombarding our brain in a second. But we keep choosing the same input into our brain. And the first law of the mind is called the law of association. And the law of association is how the yellow brain works. We use or identify past experiences to really build a bigger model. We identify with our knowns. When you associate, you're drawing from your present knowledge base to be able to understand. Didn't I say that a neuron looks like a big tree? How many people image that? The moment you image that, you associated what? A neuron with a tree. And you went, oh yeah, I know what that looks like. So we learn by these associations. And those associations develop a groundwork to listen. It makes a groundwork to accept things as ordinary or common. You know, when you're a child, you're constantly... Why, why do children constantly interact with their environment and pick things up and do all that stuff? Because their brain is learning at an alarming rate. And what they're doing is trying to sort out the laws so that it all becomes ordinary. And they scientifically know that between the age of five and seven, they've developed critical facilities. So they start developing those critical facilities, and of course it's accelerated by television and everything else because they're gathering more data at an alarming rate that's giving them an in information to associate with. So law of association says I associate with my present knowledge base to be able to understand another concept or another idea. That's a great thing. That's a good thing that the yellow brain should do. The second law of the brain is called the law of repetition. And the law of repetition says if I do something over and over again, what's going to happen? it's going to become common or ordinary or easy. Think about any skill or task that you've ever learned. At first you start to learn it and it's hard and you can't get it, but you, what do you do? You keep practicing it over and over again until it becomes common or easy or ordinary. Now I use this example when I do my lectures to the beginning students, but here's a great example of law of association and law of repetition. When I was in college and I had roommates, I had roommates that always fell asleep when they studied. Well, I studied at my desk and they laid on their bed and read the book. And within 15 minutes, I'd look over my shoulder, and they would be face planted into the book, drool all over the book. Now, what does the law of association, law of repetition say? Law of association says, I associate bed with, and I go to bed every, no, so that's gonna, that's gonna be an ordinary or an unconscious process, and you can guarantee that in 15 minutes, that, that associative pattern is gonna put them to sleep. You understand? So we learn by the law of association, the law of repetition, and they give rise to habits and behaviors. And that's a great thing. That's how we build models of thought. If I said, if you could see the nerves coming out of the spine, they look like spaghettis coming out of there. Can everybody see what that looks like? That's how we associate. You have made that uncommon process 
very common. You've made it ordinary. You've had to review it over in your mind. You've had to model it in your brain. You've had to picture yourself doing it. You've had to do it almost to the point where you're bored that many times. And there comes a moment where it clicks, right? And you've just what? Had a very linear process become very non-linear. And the moment that that happens, this part of the brain is endorsing that neural net. It's giving it permission to happen. And when that happens, you can drive your stick shift, have a conversation, drink a cup of coffee, talk on the phone, you know, steer with your knee, do all of that stuff, right? But if I asked you to do that when you're initially starting out, you didn't have enough neural connections up there. So I said to them, and I was appealing to the neurologists in the room, I said, so neurologically, if we can make those connections in our brain, and you had the science of manifesting something from nothing, out of nowhere, then would everybody agree with me that the moment that we practice that over and over again, that that uncommon process would become very common? So could you have a conversation at the dinner table and just manifest a loaf of bread? You could absolutely do it. It would be no effort to do, just like to drive your car because it would be hooked up neurologically to this part of the brain. And once it's hooked up here, it becomes very ordinary.